Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so, as, so I'm Maya, this is Neve, and uh, yeah, we're going to be presenting our project um, on clustering women's football players. So Neve, uh, Yasmin, uh, and I are all PhD students. We're studying maths up in Edinburgh, um, and we also work with Natasha, who's um, a data analyst, also working in Edinburgh. Um, we're fairly new football fans, I think, um, it's fair to say. Um, kind of got interested watching the Euros last year. Um, got interested in football analytics, specifically for, for women's football. So, yeah, we're really excited to present today what we've been working on um, over the summer. So, our work kind of aims to address the question of whether or not we can cluster women's football players um, into functional types based on on-ball event data. Um, and this question is sort of motivated by um, Antonio Gagliardi, who currently is the technical coach um, for Saudi Arabia, but before that works with the Italian national team for, for quite a while. Um, and he said that in modern football, player roles are not represented by their position on the pitch, but rather by their functions. Um, and this has kind of been addressed for the men's game um, by Gagliardi and, and Sockerman Research, who last year published um, the clustering project. Um, and this project, yeah, group men, uh, men's footballers um, into these functional roles um, uh, by, yeah, by the function that they're performing um, on the pitch. But in general, I think as we heard earlier in the panel today, men's football and women's football, you know, they are distinct. Um, models can distinguish between the two and um, in general, you can't just apply men's football analytics straight onto, onto the women's game. Um, so we wanted to kind of take this framework um, apply it to, to uh, data from women's football um, and see if we could uh, kind of, you know, find any insights there um, that may be a little bit different to the men's game. So we defined our own functional types that are distinct from, from the men's uh, functional roles. Um, we have a look at uh, hybrid players who change function over different seasons uh, of the WSL. Um, and then we kind of finish up by looking at composition of different teams in the WSL um, and uh, the Lionesses internationally as well. So the data that we use for this is um, five seasons worth of WSL data uh, provided by StatsBomb. So this is just the event data um, that's uh, kind of, I think, freely available um, online. Um, and from this data, we generated our own features um, and kind of added like spatial components by uh, sort of splitting the pitch up into quite a coarse grid. So for example, if we count the number of passes uh, for each player, um, then we can count the number of passes completed in, say, the widest third or um, shots taken inside the box and outside the box and kind of in that way uh, have a spatial component uh, to the data that we're using. And what you can see on, on the plot uh, on the right there is that when we discard players who have not played for a sufficient number of minutes, um, we're actually left with very few players. So this is looking at players who played um, more than a thousand minutes across the past five years in the WSL. Um, and if we discard players who didn't play uh, beyond that threshold, we only have 343 players remaining, which is a pretty small sample size. Um, and kind of goes back to, to the points uh, mentioned yeah, earlier in the panel. There is a bit of a problem with data availability and how much data we have available for women. So this makes it a bit of a challenge um, to kind of, you know, conduct like rigorous analysis uh, for women's football, just because sample sizes tend to be a lot smaller than for men's football. Um, so what we're presenting today is, is more of an exploration or maybe like an illustration um, of, you know, of what, what we can do and what we'd like to extend further if and when we get uh, the data that, that we'd like. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly mention uh, the methods that we used as well, um, as well as quite standard uh, data pre-processing techniques. Uh, we also used uh, dimensionality reduction. So we used principal component analysis um, just to reduce the size of the, um, of the feature space. Um, and the clustering model that, that we applied was a Gaussian mixture model. Um, and when you're, when you're applying a clustering algorithm to, to, to a data set, you need to kind of, in general, you need to choose how many clusters um, you'd like to group your data into. So this is quite, I mean, this is, highly problem specific. Um, but the way we went about this here, you can see in this plot, is we just considered the weights of the, um, of the clusters. You can see there's uh, sort of a gap here between the weight of the 11th cluster and the 12th cluster. That's just indicated by that red line. Um, and so this sort of indicates that that 11 clusters should be uh, sufficient in this case to sort of describe um, 
uh, yeah, the grouping that, that we see in the data set. So we apply this Gaussian mixture model to, to our data set um, of the five seasons of, of WSL event data. Um, but then we want to look into how each of these clusters are related uh, to the features we generated. So and that will allow us to, to kind of see which functions each cluster is describing um, and describe the players that are in each cluster. So um, that's what you can see on this plot here. So we have some features along the bottom uh, and the cluster, so each row here represents a cluster. Um, and you can see that, you know, how they're, how they're correlated uh, to each feature. So for example, if we, if we take the top row, uh, the first cluster, we can see that there's a very strong correlation here between uh, this first cluster um, and all kinds of shots. So shots inside the box, outside the box, um, and so on. Um, and if you look at the top right corner as well, you can see that players in this cluster tend to complete um, a much lower than average number of passes in the defensive third. So that kind of suggests here that maybe players uh, in this cluster um, tend to perform like attacking actions, um, you know, much kind of deeper in the attacking third. Um, and this sort of motivates the name that, that we gave it here, which is uh, finishers. Um, so all of these names down the side are just uh, names that we kind of came up with based on, based on the features that um, each cluster is correlated with. Um, and yeah, we also have the second cluster here. We call them interception masters because uh, you can see there's very strong correlations here with like 50-50s, interceptions, and duels. Um, and what's interesting about this cluster that uh, we didn't see in the previous cluster is that there's not actually a strong correlation here um, with any specific um, kind of section of the pitch. So this cluster is really describing um, the players function based on the actions they're completing as opposed to where on the pitch they are and maybe which traditional position um, they play. So we can then visualize these clusters um, in two dimensions here. So each point on this scatter plot uh, represents a player. These are the players that played in the five seasons um, of, of the WSL. Um, and yeah, they're, they're colored by the cluster um, that they belong to. So one thing to notice here is that there's this little cluster in the bottom that's spatially very separated uh, from all of the others. Um, and this cluster actually contains all of the goalkeepers in the WSL. And that kind of like intuitively makes sense. Um, we expect that the function that a goalkeeper performs is pretty different to um, the function of like outfield players. So this kind of just confirms that the model is doing something sensible. Um, and also in general, what we noticed from this plot is that kind of as you move from the left over to the right, um, you're seeing uh, the clusters change from more defensive type actions to more attacking type actions. Um, so then I'll just highlight a couple of players um, in each cluster. You can see here, yeah, these, these are just examples of uh, WSL players that have been assigned to each cluster. Um, and I guess we can pick out Rachel Daly here, who uh, has been assigned to the finishers cluster. Um, and again, this kind of confirms that, that there's something sensible happening, that this model is reflecting what, what is happening in the WSL. Because, I mean, Rachel Daly was the top goal scorer last season. So, um, yeah, clearly she's, you know, effective at, at, at finishing um, in that sense. So that's kind of a brief overview of the 11 clusters that we defined. Um, and then I'm going to pass you back to Neve uh, to go through a little bit more. Um, so now I'm going to introduce the concept of hybrid and consistent players. So we define consistent players to be those who performed the same function over all five years of the WSL, and hybrid players to be players who changed function at least four times over that over the five seasons. Um, and these players are exemplified here by Chelsea's Magdalena Eriksson and Jess Carter. So looking at this plot, we see the five seasons on the x-axis and some different position, uh, different functions, sorry, um, over that time. So if we look first at the red line, which represents Magdalena Eriksson, um, we can see that she performed in a versatile back position function for the five years. Um, so we describe her as a consistent player. Um, consistent players are important for a team because they are reliable in their function. They also offer a, spe a specialism in that function because they're playing the same role over and over again. Um, and this reliability and consistency is also reflected in the fact that 
Magdalena Eriksson, Captain Chelsea, um, from 1920 or the 2019 20 season to the 2022 23 season. In contrast, Jess Carter has changed function every year um, in the past five years of the WSL. So we describe her as a hybrid player. So hybrid players are also important for a team because they are versatile, they can fill in all different types of positions, um, which is important in scouting, or if a player leaves, they can fill in easily. Uh, it's also important for injuries, which we know is a big problem in women's football. Um, so yeah, both these types of players are very important parts of team. So next we look at the functional composition of a team. We've decided to choose Manchester United because it's a very young team. Um, they only reformed in 2018 and only joined the WSL in 2019. And they've raised up the league from fourth position to second position in the 2022-23 season. Um, so if we, we look at their composition, we can see that interception masters play a big role in their um, team. Uh, aside from that, over the four years, um, the squad changes quite a bit. In the 2019-20 season, the team is made up of more defensive functions. So we've got ball clearers, um, defensive shield, all-around playmakers. As, as we go to 2022-23 season, more finishers are introduced. So Ella Toon, Alessia Russo are introduced. Um, and that type of um, composition paid off for the team as they came second in the most recent season. Um, so looking at team composition in this way is helpful to see what type of composition worked well for a team, but it also is helpful to identify any gaps um, that there might be. Next, we looked at the proportion of each type of different function in all of the WSL compared to England's um, international teams um, from the 2019 and 2023 World Cups and 2022 Euros. So overall, we can see that in the WSL, the distribution of functions is, more, is a bit more uniform for the WSL, but for international tournaments, there's some spikes um, at interception masters and all around playmakers. So that reflects the different nature of these tournaments. So obviously international competitions are knockout, they're more high risk. So you want um, a different composition of players and you want all around playmakers for um, scoring goals. And finally, we looked at the composition of the Lionesses team in the Euros and the World Cup. So we know that England performed really well in both these competitions. Uh, they came first in the Euros and second in the World Cup. Um, and if we look at the composition of their teams, um, we can see that in 2022, more of the functional roles are represented in this team. It's a more well-rounded team. We also see a big contribution of all-around playmakers and intercepting strikers, which were then lacking in the 2023 team. So players like Beth Mead, she's an intercepting striker, but we lost her um, to injury for the World Cup. And players like um, Jill Scott and Ellen White retired. So uh, the team composition was very different. So to compensate from, for that, it seems... So players have had to change their functional role. So Alessia Russo changed from an interception master to a finisher. And Chloe Kelly changed from an all-around playmaker to an interception master for, these, for this tournament. Um, so this composition didn't prove as successful as the Euros and could be seen as a bit more one-dimensional than, than the Euros. Um, so to conclude, we found interpretable clusters for women's football players. We identified hybrid and consistent player types and highlighted team compositions. And we compared functional roles of international versus domestic players. Um, and another thing we want to do next, which we think is really important, um, 
is to compare our findings to the Sockerman paper that focused just on men's football. Um, so we can highlight any unique roles or functions that are present in the women's game and to further emphasize the need for independent analysis on the women's game. Um, and that's everything. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. <clears throat> um, based on the paper that you mentioned for the men's football and based on your analysis for women's, what do you think is the, what are the biggest differences between the functions between the two? I mean, you were, at the end you were saying that you're planning to do some analysis, but maybe you have some thoughts already. Um, yeah, so just mostly due to time constraints, that just wasn't something that we ended up doing, but that was kind of something that we set out you know, when we started the work, that was, you know, really what we wanted to do. Um, I mean, the only thing I can really say at this stage is that um, the way that we clustered the players was slightly different. So in the paper that we mentioned, um, firstly, they had 13 clusters and they didn't include goalkeepers. So we already know that there's um, kind of a difference in the number of clusters we identified in the data set. Um, but also the way they did this is they clustered firstly into sort of five clusters and then they sub-clustered each of those. Um, and the motivation behind doing this wasn't really clear um, when we read the paper and we didn't, you know, based on the, the data and the clustering that we had, we didn't really have a good reason to, to do it that way. Um, so ultimately we didn't, we didn't do that, we just kind of directly uh, clustered into 11 groups. Um, but I think, yeah, that's basically the, the, the step, well, the two steps we need to do is, is kind of dig into why they, why they did it this way with the sort of clustering and subclustering. Um, and then actually have a look at what, what the differences are. Um, but obviously, kind of as we mentioned, there's a bit of an issue with, with really small sample size. And when you have very small sample sizes, you're talking about clusters that are very small. So the clustering itself is not very stable. Um, and that's something we need to work on as well. Um, so we don't know yet, but that's definitely something we're going we're gonna to look into. Do you have any sort of validation techniques that you've tried or you want to try to confirm that the feature representation, you said you have a coarse spatial representation, all of that, in any way that you know that if you make a change, it improves or disimproves the sort of representation? I don't uh, Yeah, so, um, so we actually, um, the set of features that we used are actually not all of the features we generated. So we did find that some features um, significantly worse than the model in the sense that, you know, they would put players into clusters that we just, you know, that weren't quite right um, and made the clustering more unstable. Um, and those were actually mostly related to uh, the location on the pitch. So we had a kind of, you know, standard deviation, like average position of where a player was performing the event, a standard deviation to kind of see how much they were like moving about the pitch and those kinds of things. Um, and they made the clustering, yeah, worse um, based on like, you know, knowledge we have of the players already. Um, so we did do we, so we did do um, some kind of validation in that sense. Um, yeah, and then I guess the other thing to validate the model is because we do know that the clustering is a bit unstable because of the sample size. Um, what we'd like to do is kind of run the clustering, say I don't know, a hundred thousand times, um, and kind of come up with like a uh, um, like a confidence. Um, uh, yeah, basically, you know, probability of belonging to a specific cluster so we can, so we can attach a kind of confidence to that clustering. Um, again, yeah, that's the next step that we're, you know, we're aware of sort of as an issue, um, but just didn't quite have the time to implement. Yeah.